The following evening, uh, punctual to my appointment, I placed my foot on the first notch of the zigzag as the distant clocks were striking eleven. He was waiting for me at the bottom, with his white light on. I have not called out as you requested. May I speak now? By all means, sir. Here's my hand. There's a fire inside the hut. I have made up my mind, sir, that you shall not have to ask me twice what troubles me. I took you for someone else yesterday evening. That troubles me. That mistake? No, that's someone else. Who is it? I don't know. Like me? I don't know. I never saw the face. The left arm is across the face, and the right arm is waved. Violently waved. This way. I followed his action with my eyes. And it was the action of an arm gesticulating with the utmost passion and vehemence. For God's sake, clear the way. One foggy night I was sitting here watching the patterns in the fire when I heard a voice. Hello, Below there! I started up, looked from the door and saw this. Someone else standing by the red light near the tunnel, waving as I just now showed you. The voice seemed hoarse with shouting, and it cried, Look out! Look out! And then again, Below her! Below there! Look out! I took my lamp, turned it on red, and ran towards the figure, calling, What's wrong? What has happened? Where? It stood just outside the blackness of the tunnel. I advanced close upon it, but it kept the sleeve across its eyes. I ran right up at it and had my hand stretch out to pull the sleeve away when it was gone. Into the tunnel? No. I ran on into the tunnel, 500 yards. I stopped and held my lamp above my head and saw the wet stains stealing down the walls and trickling through the arch, but nothing else. I ran out again, faster than I'd run in, for I had a mortal abhorrence of the place upon me, and, and I looked all around the red light with my own red light, and I went up the iron ladder to the gallery atop of it, and I came down again and ran back here. I telegraphed both ways. An alarm has been given. Is anything wrong? The answer came back. Both ways. All well. My dear fellow, you must not trouble yourself with this. There is surely a rational explanation. The figure that you saw must be a deception of your sense of sight. I have seen it many times. A minor disease of the delicate nerves that make the eye function properly. And what of the cry? Nothing but the wind in this unnatural valley. Listen for a minute. Hear how it makes a wild harp of the telegraph wires. We must look to our rational senses for an answer. I know something of the wind and the wires, sir, having passed many a long winter night here alone and watching, but I still have not finished. Within six hours of the appearance, the memorable accident on this line occurred. Within ten hours, the dead and wounded were brought along through the tunnel over the spot where the figure had stood. I was aware of the tragedy. My landlady mentioned it last night. A remarkable coincidence, my friend, but no more than that. There's more, sir. The collision I described was just a year ago. Six or seven months passed, and I had recovered from the surprise and shock when one morning, as the day was breaking, I was stood at that door. When I looked towards the red light, I saw the spectre again. Did it cry out? No, it was silent. Did it wave its arm? No, it's leaned against the shaft of the light with both hands before the face. Like this. Once more, I followed his action with my eyes. It was an action of mourning. I have seen such an attitude in stone figures on tombs. Did you go up to it? I shouted to it. Where is the danger? Answer! What can I do? But it did not answer. I came in and sat down, partly to collect my thoughts, partly because it had turned me faint. When I went to the door again, daylight was above me. 
and the ghost was gone. But nothing followed. Nothing came of this. That very day, as a train came out of the tunnel, I noticed at a carriage window on my side what looked like a confusion of hands and heads and something waved. I saw it just in time to signal the driver stop. He shut off and put his brake on, but the train drifted past here 150 yards or more. I ran after it, and as I went along, heard these terrible screams and cries. A beautiful young lady had died instantaneously in one of the compartments and was brought in here and laid down on the floor between us. Now, sir, mark this and judge how my mind is troubled. The spectre came back a week ago. Ever since it has been there now and again by fits and starts. At the light. At the danger light. But what does it seem to do? He repeated, if possible with increased passion and vehemence, that former gesticulation as if to say, I supposed, for God's sake, clear the way. I have no peace or rest from it. It calls to me for many minutes together in an agonised manner. Below there! Look out! Look out! It stands waving to me. It rings my little bell. Did it ring your bell yesterday evening when I was here and you went to the door? Twice. Why? See, your imagination misleads you. My eyes were on the bell and my ears were open to the bell. It did not ring at those times, nor at any other time, except when it was rung in the natural course of physical things by the station communicating with me. I have never made a mistake as to that yet, sir. I have never... Confuse the spectre's ring with the man's. The ghost's ring is a strange vibration in the bell. And I have not asserted that the bell stirs to the eye. I don't wonder that you failed to hear it, but I heard it. And did the spectre seem to be there when you looked out? It was there, both times. Will you come to the door with me and look for it now? Very well. Do you see it? No. It is not there. Agreed. By this time, you will fully understand, sir, that what troubles me so dreadfully is the question, what does the spectre mean? Well, I'm not sure I do fully understand. What is it warning against? What is the danger? Where is the danger? There is danger overhanging somewhere on the line. Some dreadful calamity will happen. It is not to be doubted this third time after what has gone before. But surely this is a cruel haunting of me. What can I do? If I telegraph danger on either side of me or on both, I can give no reason for it. I should get into trouble and do no good. <laughs> they would think I was mad. This is the way it would work. Message. Danger. Take care. Answer. What danger? Where? Message. Don't know. But for God's sake, take care. They would displace me. What else could they do? Please, calm yourself. When the friend. spectre first stood under the danger light, why not tell me where that accident was to happen, if it must happen? Why not tell me how it could be averted, if it could have been averted? When, on its second coming, it hid its face. Why not tell me instead, she is going to die. Let them keep her at home. If it came on these two occasions only to show me that its warnings were true and so to prepare me for the third, why not warn me plainly now? And I, Lord help me, a mere poor signalman on this solitary station, why not go to somebody with credit to be believed? and power to act. But my dear friend, you must listen to me. Compose yourself. Any man that thoroughly discharges his duties must do well. And there is no more that you can do. I have studied you these past two days and I am convinced that there is no man who could carry out his task with more attention and responsibility than you. But there will be a third time. Of that I'm certain. Calm yourself, dear fellow. I shall return tomorrow. 
In the meantime, I will write to a friend of mine in London. He is the wisest medical practitioner I know, and we will take his opinion as to your state of mind. I can't travel to London, sir. My duty is the bell. Fear not, my friend. The medical practitioner shall visit you here. I shall remunerate him adequately. But, sir, I couldn't possibly... I shall not hear another word. In a few days, we shall have concluded this unfortunate business once and for all. Good night. Sleep well, my friend. Good night, sir. That I more than once looked back at the red light as I ascended the pathway, that I did not like the red light, and that I should have slept but poorly if my bed had been under it. I see no reason to conceal. Nor did I like the two sequences of the accident and the dead girl. I see no reason to conceal that either. My sleep was troubled that night. I awoke troubled, and quickly dressed, intent on visiting the signalman once again. Going out, sir? A short walk before breakfast. Down to the railway line again? Something like that. Don't be too long, sir. I've got a nice pair of kippers for your breakfast. When I reached the point at which I had first encountered the signalman, I mechanically looked down. I cannot describe the thrill that seized upon me when, close at the mouth of the tunnel, I saw the appearance of a man with his left sleeve across his eyes, passionately waving his right arm. A nameless horror that oppressed me passed in a moment, for I saw that this appearance of a man was a man indeed and nothing more. There was a little group of other men standing at a short distance to whom he seemed to be rehearsing the gesture he made. The danger light was not yet lighted. Against its shaft was a low makeshift construction, entirely new to me, made of some wooden supports and tarpaulin. It looked no bigger than a bed. I had an irresistible sense that something was wrong. Clambering down the embankment with all the speed I could make, I reproached myself as I sensed the fatal mischief had come of my leaving the man there alone last night. It can't be. To my horror, I saw the wooden construction partially surrounded a shape covered with a grey sheet. I knew immediately the obscured object was a body. You men, what's happened? I'm coming down. With far less precaution than on my previous visits, I scrambled down the steep zigzag path, my heart beating hard in my chest. I reached the group of men, whom I supposed to be workmen, and, pushing my way through them, addressed the one that I had seen from above, enacting the gesticulations to the others. From the uniqueness of his cap and jacket, I immediately knew him to be an engine driver. What is the matter? Signalman. Killed this morning, sir. Not the man belonging to that box? Yes, sir. Not the man I know? Well, you'll recognise him, sir, if you knew him, for his face is quite composed. One of the other men solemnly raised an end of the tarpaulin. I turned away from the body lying there, although the signalman's face was indeed composed. How did this happen? He was cut down by my engine, sir. No man in England knew his work better, but somehow he was not clear of the outer rail. It was just at broad day, he'd struck the light and had the lamp in his hand. As the engine came out the tunnel, his back was towards us and she cut him down. I'll show you, sir. The engine driver stepped back to his former place at the mouth of the tunnel. Coming around the curve in the tunnel, sir, I saw him at the end, like as if I saw him down a perspective glass. There was no time to check speed. I knew him to be very careful. As he didn't seem to take heed of the whistle, I shut it off when we were running down upon him and called to him as loud as I could call. What did you say? What were your exact words? It were a dreadful time, sir. I never left off calling him. I put this arm before my eyes, not to see. 
and I waved this arm to the last. But it were no use. But your words, tell me the precise words you shouted to him. I need not have asked, or I knew already. And yet, as he repeated those words, a chill ran up my spine. For not only were the words he had used as a warning, those which the unfortunate signalman had repeated to me as haunting him, but also the words which I myself, not he, had attached, and only in my mind, to the gesticulation he had imitated. Below there! Look out! Look out! For God's sake, clear the way! 